Dear brothers and sisters, we have been elaborating on the rules of the obligatory baths or the obligatory ghusl. Of course, we have explained some of the rules and there are some other rules left to be explained in this session. The first question in regard to the a person to who is in the state of ritual impurity, regardless of whether that person is a woman or a man, whether he or she is in the state of Janaba or maybe in the state of any other ritual impurity, um, it is of course necessary for him to know that there are certain makru acts, certain abominable or undesirable or re reprehensible acts that he may not do. Of course, if he does them, if he commits them, he has committed an abominable act, an undesirable act. He will not be punished, he will not be reprehended for doing that act. There are some nine uh, things which are makru for a person in the state of, let's say, janab. Uh, the first one is to eat. The second one is to drink. The third one is to recite. From the Holy Quran, more than seven verses. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, Reciting more than seven verses from the Holy Quran does not mean that the person who recites does not earn any reward, does not get any reward or any sawab for reciting the Quran. He will get the sawab, but he will get less sawab. He will get less reward for reciting the Quran. And of course, as I mentioned in the previous session, it is haram for him or for a woman in the state of ritual impurity to recite those verses or those surahs of the Quran which contain an obligatory sajda. Of course, depending on the mujtahid you follow, you have to be careful. And for those who want to exercise precaution, it's better for him not to recite the whole surah because there are certain scholars, certain mujtahid who consider reciting the whole surah as abomin as haram as forbidden but okay there are some other scholars who do not consider reciting the whole surahs as forbidden only the verse or those verses four verses which contain the obligatory sajdas should not be recited by a person in the state of janab now the fourth the fourth makruh act is to touch the cover, the margin, and the sides of the Qur'an. Of course, reciting the, touching the script of the Holy Qur'an is forbidden. But touching the script, the margin, the sides, and the cover of the Qur'an is makruh for a person in the state of Janaba. Now, of course, uh, the fifth uh, makruh act is to carry a Quran with you or to keep the Quran with you. You are in the state of Janaba, it's makru. It's abominable to keep the Quran with you. The sixth makru act is to sleep while you are in the state of Janaba. It is makru for you to sleep while you are in the state of Janaba. Of course, 
you can perform wudu or uh, do tayammum do tayammum uh, in the absence of water in case you perform tayammum then that karaha that reprehensibility abominableness would be removed the seventh uh, makruh thing or the mak makruh act is uh, a dye uh, to color your hair to dye your hair and that is with henna, of course, because normally people use henna to dye their hair, so that is makru. And the eighth is to apply oil on your body. It's hara, it's makru, it's abominable. And the ninth is to have sexual intercourse, of, to, of course, after ihtilam, after you have in, in, entered the state of Janaba, it's makru to approach your wife for having sexual intercourse when you are already in the state of Janaba. Some people naively and maybe wrongly believe that uh, it is haram uh, to, to uh, have sexual intercourse with one's wife when he is in the state of Janaba. No, it's not haram, it is only makru. The, these were the nine uh, makru acts that you need to understand and learn and also uh, let other people know also. It's not only necessary for, for, for you to, to know, but it's also your moral and religious obligation to inform other people about the rules, about the Sharia laws, about the uh, verdicts of scholars. Now, brothers and sisters, there are some other issues that need to be explained and elaborated uh, when a person is in the state of Janaba, sometimes he might perspire, sometimes he might oh, have sweet water on his or on her body. What is the obligation if a person starts perspiring? Is his perspiration impure or not? Of course, there is no doubt that his perspiration is not impure. There are some people who believe that when a person is in the state of Janaba, he cannot touch anything, he cannot, uh, and he must wash everything that comes in contact with his body, that is a wrong uh, perception. Of course, you need to correct yourself. Uh, nothing becomes impure, nothing becomes najis, insofar as it has not come directly in contact with the essential impurity with the essential impurity, like semen, like urine. If your body, if your dress, if your garment, if your bed sheet has not come in contact with semen, then it's not necessary to wash it. It's not necessary to change it, to replace it, of course. Then that has to be clear. As I have mentioned in the previous session, of course, Janabat and the, the uh, ghusl for janabat becomes obligatory only for certain acts like obligatory prayers like entering the um, like entering masjid al haram and masjid al nabi and for all, and also uh, going to a local mosque and placing and halting placing something there picking something from the mosque or halting there staying there of course, a person in the state of Janaba cannot do these things. So, in order for him to be able and to be allowed to do such things, he must, of course, he must purify himself, he must perform ghusl Janaba. And, uh, of course, ghusl Janaba is not necessary for, for the prayer which is offered on a dead body. It is uh, not necessary. A person in the state of Janaba can still offer prayers and there would be no objection. Of course, ghusl janaba is also obligatory for the sajd, for sajda to serve. If you are reciting sajda, the obligatory sajda, or the obligatory part of a prayer that is left out, then it is necessary to be in the state of ritual impurity. And whenever you are doing ghusl janaba, it is necessary that you have to do it, that you should perform the ghusl, the whole procedure, the whole... Uh, actually ablution 
with the intention of qurba, with the intention of complying God's order and seeking nearness to, to God. No religious act is accepted unless it is accompanied with the niyyah of qurba, with the intention of seeking nearness to God and with the intention of complying God's order. Now there is another question regarding ghusl. There are two methods of performing ghusl. One is the, of course, the tartibi, sequential ghusl. And the other is irtamasi, which is done by submerging your whole body under water. Now it's important to learn to know these two methods of performing ghusl. The sequential ghusl is, of course, is clear. You know that you need to wash your head and neck, first of all. The first part of your body that you need to be washed, that, that has to be washed, is your head and neck. <laughs> Start washing the head and neck with the niyad of qurba. And then you have to wash the right side of your body, beginning from the shoulder down to the tip of your toes. Once you have finished the right side, washing the right side, of course you have to wash the left side. And, in, and as a measure of precaution, it is better, it's better to wash some portion of the other side to include a part or a portion of the other side of the body to make sure that no part of your body is left out dry or left dry. This is the tartibi, the sequential ghusl that is easy to be done and I think there is no doubt about it. Now there are some scholars who, who believe that it is not necessary to begin washing the, the right side and then the left side. Of course, it's recommended, it's better to wash, to begin washing your body uh, with the right side and then finish the ghusl washing the left side. But if you wash the whole body and a single go all at once, of course, then your ghusl would be in order according to the fatwa and verdicts of some scholars. There is no objection, no problem in washing the whole body at once. And uh, in a mixed way, even if you start washing the left side and then the right side, there would be no problem according to the verdicts of some scholars. Of course, like Ayatollah Sistani, he says that you can wash your body uh, and it does not make any difference whether you wash it uh, you start washing the left side or the right side, but it's better, it's more precautionary to begin washing your body with the right side and finishing it with the left side. Now, dear brothers and sisters, if a person forgetfully washes, for example, the left side before the right side, uh, it's not necessary to repeat the ghusl and do it all over again or to start doing, performing the ghusl from the beginning. You can wash, of course, the, for example, if you, if you have, if a part of the left, right side of your body is left dry and you are already busy washing the right side, the left side, it's not necessary to go back and start washing your head and neck. You can wash the, the right side and then the, the left side. Now, if you have completed the ghusl, you have completed it, and you've gone out of the bathroom, all of a sudden 
you remember that a part of your body was left dry. You notice that a part of the body was left dry. For example, there was an impediment or an, uh, some kind of barrier on your body. You did not know that there was a barrier preventing water from reaching the skin. So you just noticed when you had completed the ghusl and you were out of the bathroom. Now, is it necessary to bathroom, uh, wash your body all over again and to do, redo the ghusl? Or you can just, of course, wash only that part of the body which was left dry. Of course, the second option is correct. You need to wash only that part of your body which was left dry. It's not necessary to repeat the ghusl. Now, unlike wuzu, which had to be done successively and without any interval between the parts, in ghusl it's not necessary. If there is an interval between the parts of, of the body which is washed, there is no problem. You can wash your head and neck and then after an hour, for example, or after two hours, you can wash the right side of your body. After another hour, you can wash the left side of your body. So, of course, the delay will not affect, it will not harm the wudu. As far as the Irtimasi type of ghusl is concerned, I said that the second method of ghusl is to submerge your body under water. Now, sub submerging under water uh, can be done in two ways. It can be done gradually, and of course, it can be done in an instant. For example, you, you go to a swimming pool and you are standing by the swimming pool near the swimming pool and all of a sudden you dive into the swimming pool with the intention of doing an irtamasi ghusl. That is correct. And maybe you might be standing in the, in the swimming pool with your head or your body, part of your body outside the water. Again, you can, you can submerge yourself underwater with the intention of ghusl and that would be also correct. You can also do the same. For example, you can, you can uh, submerge your head and neck underwater once and then the right side of your body the next time and then the, th right, the left side of your body then the third time. This is also correct. There is no harm. There is no problem. There is no objection in doing this. This is called the gradual uh, way of submerging your body underwater. This kind of ghusl is called ghusl irtamasi because you submerge your body under water without pouring water on your body. Unlike wudu, which required the person to make sure that the parts of bo uh, his body that was, was supposed to be washed should be clean, unlike wudu, in ghusl it's not necessary to purify your body before doing the ghusl. Maybe your body can be you, your body might be unclean, it might be najis, and that will not affect the validity of ghusl. You can perform ghusl, and in meanwhile, while doing ghusl, you can wash yourself, you can make yourself clean if your body had been uh, wet, uh, had been impure, had been ritually unclean. Now, some people ask questions about nail polish. Some women, they have nails, they have nail polish on their toes and on their hand nails, on their fingers. What is the Islamic law about the nail polish? Should it be removed before ghusl or not? Of course, there's no doubt that the nail polish must be removed because it forms a barrier, it forms an obstruction. And that obstruction means that the water does not reach the nail plates, so it has to be removed. But in wuzu, of course, it's not necessary to remove the polish from your toes. If one toe is left without polish, that would be okay. You can wipe uh, on that toe. But in ghusl, the entire nail polish has to be removed. Now, in winter, some ladies, of course, have long hair. Is it necessary for ladies, for women to wash their hair, all, part, all the hair or not? Of course, it's not necessary to wash 
the hair. If you have very short hair, it's necessary to wash the, the hair. But if you have very long hair, then it's not necessary to wash the hair, the entire uh, hair. You can leave it dry and that will not affect your ghusl. <laughs> Sisters, while performing ghusl, you might need to release yourself or to ease yourself and uh, to urinate or to pass wind. Does urinating or passing wind Invalidate ghusl or not? Of course, passing wind will not invalidate ghusl. In the same way, urinating will not invalidate ghusl. What has to be taken into consideration is that you cannot offer prayers with the ghusl you performed. You have to wait until your hair dries and your feet are dry. Then you have to make wudu. Because as we said, ghusl is sufficient for wudu. But when you pass wind in the middle of performing ghusl, then of course ghusl would be counted. But it will not suffice for wudu. The next question is that a person who has to do more than one ghusl, for example, there is a woman who has been in the state of highs, in the state of menstrual blood, in the state of maybe istihada, she might have touched a dead body, she might have uh, made a vow to perform ghusl ghusl and she might have been at the same time in the state of Janaba. if a person is under the obligation to perform different ghusl as I mentioned it is sufficient for her to perform one ghusl with the intention of all of them okay if he does not make such an intention if he forgets to make the intention for example he forgets to make to consider that ghusl as a ghusl for all those obligatory major ablutions, would it suffice for the other ghusl or not? Of course, it will suffice because what is necessary is to achieve ritual purity, ritual tahara, to become clean. And of course, one ghusl, if that is ghusl janaba or ghusl haith, or ghusl nifas, no matter what that type of ghusl may be, it will bring, it will achieve, it will bring you that objective and purity is achieved during one obligatory ghusl. And as I mentioned, ghusl, whether it is recommended and obligatory according to some scholars, is sufficient for wudu. But of course, the discrepancy is there. There are different scholars who have different views. And of course, majority of Shia scholars do not consider ghusl haid and ghusl mustahabbi, recommended ghusl, to be sufficient for, for wudu. They are not sufficient for wudu according to some scholars, but they are sufficient for wudu according to some other scholars. And uh, many scholars, most of the scholars say that only ghusl janabat is sufficient for wudu. Other types of ghusl like ghusl haith and ghusl nifas is not sufficient for wudu. The woman in the state of nifas should make wudu also. This is a difference of opinion. You need to investigate, you need to conduct a research yourself to make sure whether your marja allows ghusl Mustahab like Ghusl Jum'ah 
اور غسل نفاظ اور غسل حیض as being sufficient for wudu or not. Many rules which were applicable to wudu are also applicable to, to ghusl also. For example, the water which you use for performing ablution, for performing wudu or ghusl should be clean. It should not be mixed. It should be pure water. It should be unmixed water. And that it should also be halal. It should be permissible. The water which you use for doing ghusl should not have been stolen, it should not have been usurped. And also the container which you use to perform ghusl should not be haram, it should not have been usurped or taken from someone, it should not be made of. Those rules which were applicable to wudu are also applicable to ghusl. And these were some of the rules, of course. The last point that I would like to make to, to mention is that while performing, make sure that there is no obstruction, no substance, no impediment on your body. Uh, you should remove all the substances, all the things that might prevent uh, water from reaching your skin, whether it is nail polish, whether it is anything like oil, whether or any, any dirt on your body, because there are some people some who work with cars, with with motorbikes and they change the spare parts, they use oil and such things and you see that their fingers and their hands are full of dirt. So they need to of course to use some kind of detergent, some kind of soap, uh, the dirt or the substances which are left on their hands and their fingers in order to make sure that the water reaches the, their hands and their, the skin of their body. These are the rules related to ghusl. Inshallah, in the next session, we will uh, explain the rules of istihaza. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.